Good morning. And as a few have noticed, there's only one sermon outline, but it goes front and back this morning. I do not plan to go over the entirety of it this morning. I believe we'll have a good breaking point and finish it off this afternoon. So uh, there's a lot to cover in this section right here inside of Matthew uh, 16 to 17. It all seems to just fit together, and I hate to break it apart when something just seems to fit so well that you just kind of need to cover it together. But So I'm going to take advantage of this being a uh, we're back-to-back to, so that I can kind of put a even break right there and hopefully have the same crowd again this evening. Uh, of course, today the question of who is Jesus may seem like a silly question, at least for anyone in this audience. But yet, we look around us and maybe it's not such a silly question after all. You know, how, how is this world going in so many ways? How is it that nobody truly knows who Jesus really is? But in this part of here, inside of Matthew chapter 16, as we continue through the book of Matthew, you know, they have been seeing this great person. They have been handpicked. And right here, we're really looking at uh, the, the messages that are right here are focused really close to his chosen disciples. It's not the great masses like we've been seeing. He's kind of getting it down to his little group, and he is verifying with them that they are seeing what they believe they should be seeing at this point. Uh, I guess kind of like we're going through, uh, you know, this person has come in, uh, called Jesus. He's picked us. He's saying all these great things. He sounds uh, as one with authority as we saw in uh, the Sermon on the Mount at the end of it. He did not speak like the other leaders. He spoke as one having authority. He spoke as one who knows what he's talking about. He is captivating. He has our attention. But at some point, hey, pop quiz, who am I? And Jesus pulls this little pop quiz out right here is because we see this idea of faith. We see these, this core that's been following him from the beginning. and some that he has handpicked. And one that I want to look at, especially as we go through this passageway here, Peter comes uh, to the forefront again where we get to see him and some of his uh, uh, in and outs of faithfulness. Uh, we just saw where he... Uh, saw Jesus walking towards him on the water. They were afraid. He's like, wait a minute. That's Jesus. Can I come to you? And jumps out of the boat and walks to him on the water. But then what happened to him? All of a sudden, he saw the winds. He saw the turbulence around him, and he started to sink a little bit, and he needed that help. We get to see some of that again with Peter here. He's quick to action to the Lord, but then there's that little bit of lapse. He's not fully there. I, I see that in him, at least that's one thing I caught on this. Maybe it's because I've self-reflected in my own life about are we really where we should be? Are we always where we need to be in our learning and our knowledge of Christ and our knowledge of God? Is there always that extra step we can take? And I see that in Peter where he's quick to action, he's quick to take on Christ, he's quick to go to the next challenge, but yet sometimes we need to keep learning. We need to look a little deeper, and so we see that a few times. But the, getting started here, we start off in Matthew 16, starting in verse 13, where we see that Christ came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, and he asked his disciples, kind of the introductory here. He introduces the idea. Before I ask you, I want to say, what, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Who do people say that I am? Some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, some Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And if we just pause right there for a moment, we look at the idea of this little element. I think it's odd, like when you don't know who he is, maybe they didn't fully understand, because if we think about it, John the Baptist and Jesus lived at the same time. They are both in the wombs at the same time, and when their mothers got close together, they could feel their wombs kind of excited. They're happy to see each other before they were even born. 
John the Baptist was beheaded while Christ was preaching. While Christ was going around, John baptized Christ. So when we think about that, it's like, you know, an interesting thought process. Why are some people even thinking that? Maybe they just didn't know. They haven't actually physically seen the two of them and knew that it was two separate people. Some say Elijah. It was in the ideas that the uh, from Malachi 4 and 5 that uh, Elijah would come again. Uh, it says in that verse, it says, Before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord, Elijah would reappear. Now, I think some of the scribes, Pharisees, may have been taking it in a literal sense is that Elijah would actually walk in front of them again. How they would know it was Elijah, I don't know. But unfortunately, they didn't really recognize many of the prophets anyway. And when they did recognize them or see them or hear from them throughout the times, they didn't pay them any attention. But we do see where Elijah, in the form and the essence of making the path of the Lord coming, did reappear before Christ. We'll get back to that one as we go forward, but as a hint, it's at the end, looking at uh, in chapter 17. But, Simon P but then Christ said, okay, that was the introductory question. Now here's the real question. But who do you say that I am. It's kind of an interesting thing. If you stop and think about his first question, he already gives us a hint. Don't you love it when your teacher would give you the answer in the question? So in this first question in verse 13, who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? Kind of already prompted him a little bit, but yet Simon Peter jumped up, answered, and said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Where would he have received that information from? Where would Peter have seen this and made all the dots to it? Is this how he was able to jump out of the boat and walk on the water? Because he was so fixated on the idea that through his faith he answered, saying, you are the son of the living God. You are the one that we have been waiting for. You are the king of kings. You are the one to come. Jesus answered and said, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Now, I do not believe in any way that this means that uh, the God the Father came down and whispered in Simon, Simon's uh, ears. How do we receive information from the Father? When we look at this, it is coming from the words of that Christ has given to us are the words of the Father. If you have seen me, then you have seen the Father, Christ has said in various places. The words I bring to you are those of my Father. Because of that faith, because of his focus, because of his listening to what Christ has said and seeing what all has been done, he draws the conclusion through faith that there is only one possibility here. You are not just a prophet. You are not just some magician. You are not just some hoax. You are him. As we looked at back on, since we're talking about walking on the water, when Christ said, I am. The same words that were used in the Old Testament to describe God, and that was all that was needed. I am. Peter is seeing this. He is recognizing it. It's sinking in. It's getting to him, saying that this is what it needs to be. And because of that, we see several things. You know, Jesus starts to prophesy, including his disciples into the words and letting them know what is to come. He starts to give them a little bit more background information, a little bit more uh, focus to what is coming. And as we start seeing these next areas here, we see this phrase that we hear over and over throughout the religious world, but do we fully understand it? And this is where Christ looks at him and says, And I also say to you, art, you art Peter, on this rock I will build my church. And the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. 
And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatsoever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Breaking this down, there's so much to look at here, and thus why you know this you know turning into more of a two-part sermon here is that it. I don't want to skip this, but it brings so much opportunity to come back and study deeper and more. Just those two verses have so much information. That you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church. Now, if we, you know, how many have ever looked up what their name means? If we go back and look at your name and, you know, you try and search it out, figure out what does the name really mean? Well, the name Peter in the Greek means rock but more specifically a small stone you know it's the greek word petros and then jesus says but on this rock i will build my church but the rock that he says he'll build his church on is the greek word of petra meaning foundation large boulder it is two different ideas on word plays is that we've got you know i say a word play but really peter is a rock the statement he made is truth. It is foundational. That statement is the rock. If we just look at it from a vocabulary standpoint, I, in researching this and digging into it deeper, you know, there's all these different ideas about what Peter and rock, and rock means Peter, and no. If we look at it from the most basic standpoint, first, you know, the New Testament is written in the Greek. Go back to the Greek and you see the difference between Petros and Petra. Some translations translate it the same word, which then makes it easier to confuse the two and overlap them when there's not supposed to be an overlap. But if we just look at the word, and I say to you, you are Peter and on this rock. He's saying you, Peter, this rock. Two completely separate things. Even just the basic words that Christ used, if we try to confuse rock and rock and think they're the same, you are Peter, but on this rock, on the rock of what you just said, that you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Is that not what the church is founded about? You know, he says that he will build his church. What foundation do we have of the church? The foundation is the builder himself. The, the foundation is that he is the son of God. Why is it that before we are baptized, we are asked, do we believe that Jesus Christ is the son of God? If we don't believe that first step, do we believe anything else that Christ has to say? Do we have any authority for anything else that we do? When we, what does Christ base all of his ministry on? The entirety of everything that he has done to this point for what he is about to do over the next couple of months before he is crucified, everything is by the premise and the foundation that he is the son of the living God. If that weren't so, then the prophecies of the Old Testament would not be complete. If it was so, then that means he could not take and fulfill the law. Everything hinges on this one short sentence, this one verse. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. If we don't have that as our foundation, then nothing I say matters. Nothing I look at or read about in these, the page of the New Testament has any purpose whatsoever if that is not true we need that petra we need that rock that solid firm foundation from there we also see where he says that the gates of hades will not prevail against it some versions translate it will not uh, be victorious against it in a couple of months time from this point right here, Christ will be crucified. If I remember, you know, in looking at it, it's about three months. He is telling his disciples, he's getting them ready now. 
in about three months' time, the gate of Hades will not prevail against it. He is building up the foundation of the church. He is building it now, and he has said that hell, the Hadean realm, the afterlife, when we die here and our soul departs our body, that will not stop the church from coming because he will conquer the grave. He will rise again, and that will bring the power of death out of the equation. When he does that, you know, and as he does that, he's already said two times in the previous few chapters, uh, once in uh, chapter 12, once in chapter 16, when the Pharisees asked him, we want a sign from heaven. He said, the sign you will receive is that of Jonah. When that sign is complete, that shows that the gate of H the Hadean realm has no longer can prevail against. He will conquer it. He will open it up. And as he opens it, he gives them the keys to the kingdom. Now think about this for just a moment where you're in an area where the, your only safekeeping is to go bury your treasure in, uh, in a plot of land someplace because you don't have a lock on your front door. You may not even have a door. Most didn't. You know, it seems, you know, from what I've been able to tell is if you had a door, then you were someone special. You know, unless you had like a curtain or something like that, you had a way of privacy. But still, a key opens something. Now, I don't think he reached into his pocket and pulled out a set of keys and said, okay, let me go make uh, how many, 12, 13 copies? And y'all start making copies from there. We don't do that. It's not the physical keys to the kingdom, but what it is, he will give us those keys. The keys are the words that he has already spoken. The keys are the abilities that he is pro will promise them to be able to open the door. The kingdom is being built right now. Think about a building going up. We get that, firm, that solid foundation. We make sure it's solid. Then we build up. And the builders want to keep the place secure because they want to get paid at the end of this job, so we have doors on the front. When the build is complete, he turns the keys over to the owner. It is yours. We can now take that key and open the front door and walk in and welcome everyone else. As Christ is doing here, he's building up the church. He's getting it ready for entrance. And he hands the keys over. We see the keys take effect in Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 1, when the Holy Spirit arrives upon the apostles, and then in Acts chapter 2, when they stand up and give the first sermon. The keys are used to open the door. We have to be careful with this next section here. Because in too many cases, we try and use this is used in the world today as a way to do whatever we want. But is that really what it says? Because we have to take into consideration that Christ will build his church upon the rock, that he is the Son of God, he is giving them the keys to heaven, and based on that, Christ continues that sentence and says, And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, whatever you have loosed on earth will be loosed in heaven. It is not that if we decide to make a vote this morning that we can do whatever, that that is going to be accepted in heaven. That is not the purpose of this little verse right here. That is what you call taking it out of context and what the world has done too much. And for what this is, what you have bound on earth has been bound in heaven. How many times has Christ told people, let go of your earthly things? How many times do we see that already and will we see it as we continue forward where Christ says, what did he do to his disciples? When he picked them, he says, leave everything you have behind and come follow me. The rich young ruler who came to him and said, what must I do to inherit the kingdom of heaven? I've done all the laws. I've done all this. I've done all this. I've lived a good life. Sell what you have. Leave it behind. Follow me. Follow 
Christ. Follow his teachings. Follow what he has to say. If we bind the earthly things to us, what we have bound in our lives will show up later. Now, we don't show up later as in a U-Haul coming behind us. It's not like the uh, a TV uh, episode that I recently heard a section of where uh, they had to get this person a bigger casket because his requirements for burial was that all of this, 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 and this of mine will be buried in my casket with me. It's not like the pyramids where we have taken bury all of our stuff. That's not the binding. What do we bind in our hearts? Do we bind our possessions, the praises of men, the traditions of man in our hearts? What has Christ been so critical about in the religious world so far? The disconnect of the heart. The disconnect of the heart towards God. It has been so connected by the worldly things of do this, don't do this, uh, praise this, don't do this, you know. Well, if you don't want to do this, which is what God said to do, then do this instead to get around it. If that is what we abound in our hearts on earth, then Christ says you have your reward already. Think back to when he looks at the, those that are out in the marketplace standing up on a platform and praying with many words and all this fancy apparel so that they can be heard. He says they have their reward. What they abound on earth is themselves. And if we go to try to go to heaven bound, we won't make it. However, if we bind ourselves to Christ, he will bind us to heaven. If we take and submit ourselves to Christ through the watery grave of baptism, through the confession that he is the Son of God, then he will stand up and say, you are one of mine. We have the mark. We have been washed in his blood. And because of that, he will then say, you have put me on in your life. We're going to see here in a little bit where he talks about, you know, in the next uh, little part here about what profit is it a man if he gains the whole world but loses his own soul. If we let ourselves go to pick up Christ, we gain heaven through the grace of God, through the words and the promises that Christ has given, through all these things. But we have to know what we are bound to. Are we bound to the earthly or are we bound to the heavenly? What we think we're going to be able to do and be acceptable does not change the fact of what it is and where it puts us. Christ shares this information and tells them, do not tell anyone that he was Jesus the Christ. You have revealed this, Simon. You have said this through the faith that you have as being a close disciple of mine. Tell no one yet. It is not time for that at this time. He still has things he must do. He still has preparations to make. And so he uses that one more time. Tell no one yet. Then we see where Peter gets to have this moment. He's had this moment of great faith. He's had this moment of great revelation and great uh, uh, focus towards Christ, so much so that he doesn't see the full picture. He doesn't know what is to fully come yet. He hasn't thought about the scriptures that say, you know, like a lamb unto the slaughter. He hasn't looked at the way that it's going to end. And in this section right here, we start to see from that time Jesus began to show them, his disciples, that he must go to Jerusalem. After many things suffer from the elders and the chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised the third day. He's showing them how the gates of Hades will not prevail against, how the things will come about soon. 
I imagine that the disciples are not pleased with this. They have realized that he is the Christ. He has affirmed it to them, and they are excited even more. I imagine they've already been excited following him around, seeing all this greatness. But now all of a sudden he says that I must die, and it's not going to be pretty. It's not going to be good. And Peter takes him aside and rebukes him. Far be it from you, Lord. This will not happen to you. I admire the enthusiasm. He says, we will protect you. We will not let this happen to you. And then we see something that I would, you know, if I was Peter, I wouldn't expect this one either. Jesus turns to and says to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me. You have not been mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Now, this may be a few days later from the previous verses, but when we go back and look at it, what we have bound on earth and bound in heaven, what is Peter still looking at? Peter's still looking at the earthly. He's still looking at the short term. He's not seeing the full long-term goals of God and of Christ, that this must happen, which he's probably aware of from the old scriptures, from the Old Testament talking about how the Messiah will come and how he will be rejected, how he will suffer, and how he will rise again. He hadn't fully got over the earthly yet. We struggle at times in our own lives to get over this struggle, to get past this glimpse, to get past what we are doing, and sometimes we have stumbling blocks. Sometimes we get so focused on one element of it, we don't see the great picture. Christ is telling them, this must happen. This must come. And then we start to see what Jesus starts to tell them. If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. What profit is it to a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Take these verses and join them over to the verses about what is bound in, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, what you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. If we lose ourselves here, we will gain heaven. If we lose the things that are tying us down, we will save our soul. What is it that we want to focus on? Which one is the focus? It sounds so awkward to think about just on the surface. If we desire to save our life, we will lose it. Now that doesn't mean that we will die to be able to try and live. What it is is what do we choose to do inside? How will we live? Um, and just remembering who is Jesus, you know, we looked at it a little bit this, you know, with part of this morning of, he asked his disciples, who do people say that I am? Who do you say that I am? I think there's another good point to just remember on that one is that, you know, regardless of what everyone else says, what is our personal thought about this? And then how does it relate to the scriptures as he reveals to him that, yes, I am the Son of Man. And so he tells us that the church is about to be established. He is building the foundation, and it is coming to us soon. And something that we get an extra point, we stopped in the verses here in Revelation chapter 16, right before he gave us that glimpse of additional things to come. So when we get to it, he says that, You know, in chapter 16 of Matthew, starting in verse 27, you know, we just looked at the idea that we have to let go of things here on earth so that we might gain Christ. And these next two verses are a glimpse to the final judgment and of the church's establishment. 
and we've got to look at them separately and really focus it. A lot of uh, people try and lump them together, but they're not quite there. Uh, even my Bible, the way that man has added little headers into our Bibles or into the topic thoughts, it just tells it saying that it's the second coming. However, if we dig the two verses out, we see that verse 27 is the second coming. He says, For the Son of Man will come in the glory of his Father with his angels, and he will reward each according to his works. One of those works being looking at the previous verses and what have we let go here? Have we let go of the earthly things? Have we picked up Christ? Have we followed him? You know, he says in verse 24, take up his cross and follow me. Both of those, take and follow, are both actions. They are both works that must be done. And so we will be judged as to how well we have done those or if we have done them at all. And then we look at verse 28 as it continues here, and he says, Assuredly, I say to you, there are some standing here who shall not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And we can look throughout the scriptures and see various elements here of the word kingdom and the word church. They are used interchangeably. They are used at different times. And they both reference the same thing. If they don't, then I need someone to help explain that to me as to why church, why Christ had just said he will build his church and that you will see him come in his kingdom. If he uses those, but I don't see a way to get into one and a different set of rules to get into the other, all I see is each time either of those words are used, they are referencing the same thing. So when we look at this, we see the idea that Jesus has revealed himself. Who is this Jesus? We, he tells about his death that is to come, which is another element that, of the foundation that must be built to open the doors of the church or of the kingdom. Either one must be done, and we see that it must be, it will be accomplished. Now the first, if we took 27 and 28 together, we would be mighty confused about this because Christ has not come with his angels giving reward to those who have done the works yet. So we have to separate the two out. We know that he will come. It is another thing that he's telling us to watch for, be ready for. You know, and not necessarily be ready like we're sitting out at a bus stop someplace. Uh, uh, city I grew up in, we had, we had public transportation. You know, the bus said it would be there at 15 after. All right, they're not always on time, but if you're looking at your watch, you want to be there at least three to five minutes early because they might be ahead of schedule. Not likely, but sometimes. But then, you know, they might be a little late, but we knew when to look for that bus. Christ says, you know, we know that, you know, no one knows the hour except the Father. Not even the Son knows that time. But when that time comes, he will come with the glory of his Father, with his angels, and will reward each according to his work. Uh, we just finished the semester at Mississippi Delta, and so, you know, it's very interesting of that wording right there. Each will be rewarded according to his or her works. Final grades have posted for the semester. The students have been awarded for the work that they have completed and consequently not completed. Did you receive an A because you turned in quality material all semester on time? Or did you have this little thing that no one likes to see on a report card because you thought that was all optional? The teacher did not give you an F. The teacher did not give you an A. The teacher awarded each one the points that they had turned in. The same will be true in the last day for this right here. But we have to remember that the, the church will come. So when we look at the model prayer that you know Jesus told the people there that says, you know, and in part of it says, Thy kingdom come. Well, thy kingdom has come today. We are able to say that now because if we look forward to Acts chapter 2, we see the keys were used to open the kingdom. 
we see that those that were faithful, that listened to the word, that were pricked in their hearts, obeyed from the hearts the form of doctrine that was delivered. We see the kingdom has come today. But for them, for the disciples that were walking right this moment, they were trying to figure it out. They were seeing, you know, when is the kingdom to come? And that's a real monkey wrench when he just told them that he was going to die. But you're the king. You're supposed to bring in the kingdom. But you're going to die? We, how can we have a kingdom without a king? That extra element that it would be spiritual. And with that, we see this next part where we see the, uh, the beginning of chapter 17. You know, we look into 17 and we see that there is this transfiguration. There is, you know, a lot of people look at the element of when all of a sudden very few get to see this. It's been recorded for us to hear and be able to study today. And it's worth noting because there's some very valuable elements that are in this that they got to see ahead of time. So after Jesus has given the, his disciples all this information, 17 begins. Now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, and led them up high on the mountain by themselves. We see this same group of people later on in the Garden of Gethsemane as Jesus is going to pray earnestly before his uh, trials that he must face. These same men go there as well. As they are up on this mountain by themselves, and he, Jesus, was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as light. We see Jesus giving off the resemblance of his spiritual body the spiritual nature of what is to come. Now we see the same element, the same uh, picture, the same description of Christ in Revelation chapter 1 when John is in the Isle of Patmos. When he has his vision going into the uh, book of Revelation of the visions of things, he describes Christ as the Son of Man with his face shining like the sun. We also can look in the Old Testament and see where the face shined bright, where the shining is when Moses was on the mountain. But now all of a sudden, once Jesus starts showing like this right here, verse 3 says, Behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them and were talking with him. Some of the commentaries I was seeing as they talk about, and I, I, get, I get this to a point, is that, you know, for me and you, if we're about to go through a major life change, a major step in our lives, what do we do about it? Do we just sit and wonder what it's going to be like, or do we ask our friends about it? Do we ask somebody who's been there already? What can I expect? What is there? Now, this says absolutely nothing about what was said. All we do see is that we see the three representations of different parts of God's word that's been delivered. We see Moses who has brought the old law. We see Elijah who is uh, representing the prophets. And we see Christ who is bringing in the church, the kingdom. We have a representation of all three of these areas and they are there together. And Peter says, again, Peter very zealous here, very ambitious about this. He answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. Absolutely. What would you think if you were not just walking with the Son of Man, not just having a few days prior answer that you are the Son of God, the Son of the living God, and being praised for that, and now you see him in his uh likeness of who he is it is good to be here but he doesn't stop there he keeps on going if you wish let us make here three tabernacles one for each of you one for Moses and one for Elijah now the tabernacle as we think about it and you know is not great big uh, complex but 
Think of it as altars. Let us build three altars to worship you. As we've been looking at in Genesis, every time Abraham stopped, Abram stopped someplace and had a, or had a revelation from God or did something, he stopped and built an altar and worshiped God. He says, I see all three of you. You have been transferred right before us. Let us make an altar to all three of you. If they've been waiting for the Son of God, for the Son of Man to come, then why would they worship all of the others? And I think we get some of an answer right here who's getting a little ahead of himself. While he was speaking part of that sentence, it says, while he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them. Suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. The first part of this we, we have seen elsewhere. We saw this back in Matthew chapter 3 uh, in verse 17. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. We hear that when Je or we see that in the scriptures when Jesus comes up out of the water after John the Baptist baptizes him. And he said, let this be for all righteousness. Now we see this again, but he adds the, the two words, hear him. We're not focusing on Elijah. We're not focusing on Moses. We are now focused to Christ. When the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. But Jesus came, touched them, and said, Arise and do not be afraid. It is great for them to be here. They have just heard this great focus and element. And now he says, Do not be afraid. When they lifted their heads, they only saw Jesus. Very symbolic, very uh, uh, fulfilling to think about the transition here, because what time is Jesus living? Jesus is here, but he is here during the time of the Old Testament. He is during the time of the old law. He said he has not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. He has to have fulfilled the law of Moses. He is living by the words of the prophets. He is living and prophesying as the Son of Man, but yet his message is what is to come. We see this transition is that all three are present at one time, but two are about to be fulfilled. The next is about to come. It is about to be the time of Christ. And yet again, we see Christ say these words. When they came down from the mountain, Jesus commanded them, saying, Tell the vision to no one until the Son of Man is risen from the dead. I got ahead of myself there on that one. Is the reason for it being, I have not come to destroy the law. If he were to come and start teaching that those two are no longer to be listened to or followed, then he has effectively tried to destroy the law, not fulfill it. He must fulfill it first. They're getting a sneak peek. They're getting to watch the previews before the full show. Do we stop and look at what is being presented before us? Do we see the evolution of how the kingdom is being built? The kingdom is being built anew. It's not going to be with the old. Now, it may have a similar look. It may have a similar feel as far as the commandments that we are to do. But yet, it is different. And they start asking questions. You know, I, I can't tell others about this. But I can, we can still talk about this, right? We can still talk about what is to come. You know, there's a party that's coming up to honor somebody, you know, and that person doesn't know, but we can still talk amongst ourselves and get ready for it. The apostles are doing the same thing. The disciples here saying, you know, his disciples asked him in verse 10, why then do the scribes say Elijah must come first? So they know what's being taught. They know what's been taught. And now they're cu curious. Why does Elijah have to come first? And we see part of this even in the old law. We've you know, looked at part of that. And he says, Jesus' answer is this. Indeed, Elijah is coming first and will restore all things. 
But I say to you that Elijah has come already. Sounds familiar from something we talked about earlier. Whom do people say that I am? Some say John the Baptist. Some say Elijah. Some say a prophet. Some think that Christ might be the Elijah, but if Christ is Elijah, then that means that someone else has to come after him. Elijah was to come before the Son of Man comes. And so in verse 12, he says, But I say to you, Elijah has come already, and they did not know him, but did to him whatever they wished. Likewise, the Son of Man is also about to suffer at their Jesus called them blind leaders of the blind, following the traditions of men rather than the commandments of God. And rightfully so did he call all of that together. He also talks to them as far as to the point when we see that they are accused and their fathers and the, are accused of killing the prophets. What did they do to John the Baptist? They mocked him, ridiculed him. Uh, he got thrown into jail for telling the truth. He was beheaded because of uh, uh, wiles of the flesh of other people. They did not listen. He was coming to prepare the way of the Lord. What was Elijah's return supposed to be? Preparing the way. Verse 13, they see, the disciples understood that he spoke to them of John the Baptist. John came. John was the form of Elijah. It wasn't going to be Elijah coming out of his grave. It wasn't going to be you know, something of that nature, but it was someone like Elijah preparing the way, bringing it forward. But all these things they had to keep to themselves for the time being. You know, when we look at this, we start to see, and Jesus is building their foundation. He's building their, uh, their faith. He is showing them the correct way to connect the dots. There is so much rich history in the Old Testament that is there, that is true, that is faithful, but it is about to be fulfilled. It is about to take on a new look as we look at it again you know we see that he says that the kingdom will come he is building his church at this time he was building his church and the church was built this was over 2,000 years ago or just about 2,000 years ago even in the early Old Testament I don't think anyone made 2,000 years I think 900 was the 900 and something was the longest. And if Christ was true in what he said, that some standing here will not taste death till you see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom, it's here. It has arrived in Acts chapter 2 and it has continued on with the uh, continuation of the churches being built and for the congregations and for us to be able to sit in today. If the church isn't here, then why are any of us here today? Why does anyone claim the name of Christ if the church is not here? Because if the church was not built, then why do we believe what Christ said? We see what he has done. The question is, do we follow it through to its fulfillment? Do we look through all the way through, you know, After Christ died, we have the ability to move forward. The ability of the church, the things that had to happen uh, for an additional study, go and uh, follow up and read Hebrews 9 through 10. The, both cha I couldn't f figure out a verse to pick, so I just said both chapters. Because it's so integrated into both chapters about what it means. For Christ to have had to have died, the death of a testator, you know, before the testament could be fulfilled, it had it required death. The Old Testament required blood sacrifices. The New Testament, for it to cover, required the death of Christ. And he has done that for us today. They were being introduced to it here in uh, chapters 16 and 17, just as the disciples, the closest ones to him, 
we get to see it in its fulfillment today. And today, if we are to follow Christ acceptably, we too must make the confession that he is the Son of God. We have to lose the things of this world that tie us down and hold us back from heaven and be able to pick up the cross of Christ and carry it daily. We don't have to worry about it being the same cross that he carried down the actual streets. But pick up that, dare we say, a burden. Dare we say, you know, it is something that we must fulfill. We must pick him up. We pick him up by picking up this word and putting it into our hearts. We pick it up by doing, this, by doing what it says to do once we have rightly divided it. And look at the New Testament. Look at what he has told us to do, how he has told us to be. Let the actions come from the heart, not just a checklist. We can know how to be added to the church, added to the kingdom, and we can live that life here and now in the anticipation of being able to understand that if we live the church life here and now, and I say it that way, the life of a member of the kingdom, the life of a Christian, a follower of Christ, then we have bound ourselves to him here, and he will bind us there. If we are following Christ and Christ alone, we will be pleasing to God who created all things and the God that is described in the Bible. I thought very carefully of how to word that. Because how many people in this world, Christian or other religions, claim to follow God? But how many gods are there? There's only one that I'm aware of. There's a lot of man-made objects of our focus. There's only one God. There's only one true God, and that is described upon the pages of the Bible. It is verified by them and by other sources so that we might know that he is. All he had to say is, I am. And that was enough in the Old Testament. Christ himself said, I am. Christ has said, I will build my church. Are we a member of that church? Because according to God, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. If God says we have to hear Christ, do we listen? Do we really dig into it and see what it is he has for us in our lives? And then do we do it? And sometimes, even though he says his burden is light, there is still sometimes a burden we must face. There is sometimes help that we need to shed the things that we don't need. If we can be of aid or assistance to anybody in that process, please let us know while together we stand and sing.